What role did Jews play in the American Revolution? Hi, my name is Jason. Welcome to Founder of the Day. And today, we're going to celebrate Yom Kippur, which is tomorrow. Uh, and Yom Kippur is, for those of you who don't know, the Hebrew Day of Atonement. It's celebrated, the celebration is similar to Lent, um, but instead of giving up one thing for 40 days, uh, you would give up everything for one day. And that's what Yom Kippur is. Um, now, inc everything includes watching YouTube videos, so hopefully after the sun goes down, because Judaism is a moon-based calendar, so when the sun goes down, the holiday's over, um, our Jewish friends will join us to celebrate the founders and watch this video. Um, so I will say, I was raised Jewish, my father was Jewish, and my mother's Lutheran, so the Jewish founders have a, uh, a, a certain place in my heart, although... I've never actually written an article about one. There's not that many, although that might change tomorrow. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, so let's get started. To talk about Judaism and its effect in uh, on the American Revolution, you really need to go all the way back to Christopher Columbus. Um, the connection isn't often made that the same day that Columbus's ship left Spain was the same day that all Jews were banned by the Inquisition and told to get out of Spain. And therefore, there were several Jews who ended up on Columbus's ship. And throughout American history from there, Jews were involved. Now, when we get to the American Revolution, there's really only about 2,000 Jews in uh, the 13 colonies. Um, most of them were consolidated into cities. Um, Savannah and Charleston had some Jews. New York had probably the biggest Jewish population. Rhode Island, like we'll get to later, had the most famous one. Um... Uh, Philadelphia had a small amount of Jews, although, as we'll talk about during the Revolution, that changed dramatically. Um, so, uh, Revolution breaks out, and uh, you have certain founders. Uh, the, the most important founder, from my perspective, that was Jewish was probably Chaim Solomon, who was in New York City. He was an immigrant from Poland. He had started a bank and made a lot of money real quick. Um, and as the war goes on, uh, actually I should say very quickly, early on in New York when the British occupy, they throw him in prison and he gets out because he said, you know, he does some bribing with that cash and uh, he, he was allowed to leave um, under the condition that he would interpret for the, the German soldiers that were mercenaries hired by the British, um, known as Hessians primarily, uh, he would interpret for them. And that's how he got out. Uh, and he would relocate to Philadelphia about the same time as uh, another Jew, uh, a Jewish founder um, whose name is, and forgive me, uh, Gershom Mendez Sexies, I believe is how it's pronounced. I should note that at this time, most Jew Jewish people in the uh, colonies and, and the revolutionary America were of Sephardic descent which is Iberian. They were from Spain or Portugal. Um, it wouldn't be until uh, later, between the 1830s and 40s, and then through the early 1900s, when a lot of, um, <clears throat> they're called Ashkenazi Jews, would immigrate here. That was the bigger wave of Jews, and most Jews in America right now are Ashkenazi, including yours truly. Um, now, um, so forgive me if I have a little bit of difficulty pronouncing the Spanish names. Um, so Sexius was a, a, um, a rabbi in New York who also left when the British got there. He got there about the same time as Chaim Solomon and started what became for a while, a time, one of the biggest congregations in the Americas. Um, and that was really during the second half of the war itself. Um, so Sexius was there, and Chaim Solomon was there, and Solomon would end up working with Robert Morris, who's famous as the financier of the American Revolution, and uh, Governor Morris, who was also famous as number two to Robert Morris. <laughs> Unrelated, um, Governor Morris is famous for many, many other reasons as well. Um, now, uh, Solomon actually, while, while Robert Morris was overseeing the revolution financially, Solomon was the one raising the money and more or less got the donations needed and spent his own fortune on the revolution. Would actually die 
bankrupt because the United States government owed him so much money that he just poured in selflessly. Um, and there are other cases of Jews. Um, um, David Franks was another Jew who served with Benedict Arnold, which I know isn't the best name to bring up when you're talking about credentials for revolution. But he served as an aide de camp uh, before Arnold was a traitor, back when he was an American hero, which I should have a video on Arnold being a hero, which he was uh, during the Saratoga campaign and early in the war. And, and, and David Franks served with him, and then later would go overseas and work with um, several founders of there, including Benjamin Franklin and John Adams. Um, in, in uh, I'm sorry, Benjamin Franklin and John Jay in France and Spain. And he would actually serve as a, a diplomat to Morocco as well. Um, and then you have a, a sadder story of the name that, again, I have uh, Francis Salvador. It's not as hard. It's not as hard as the first one. I got it in my own head. Francis Salvador was a, a Jewish man from Georgia, from Savannah, who fought early in the war um, and was fighting Native Americans when he was killed. He was one of the first uh, Georgians killed in the revolution. Excuse me, my computer does not want to finish the video with us. Um, we, uh, he was, uh, when he died, he was actually scout. And uh, the commanding uh, colonel, uh, Thompson, who was there, uh, said, said in his final words that he was in good spirits and when all he wanted to know, despite having been scalped and dying, uh, when his commander got there, he just wanted to make sure they won the battle. It was always important to him. And then he shook the man's hand and said, I am not long for this earth, and passed away after about 45 minutes, 45 painful minutes. Um, so these are just a few, a few examples. There are, <laughs> for considering there were only about two thousand Jews, and the population of the colonies was approaching two million, approximately two million would be my best estimation. That's an extraordinarily small number, and I just rattled off four stories, um, and there's many, many more. Uh, what's notable too is when when we were fighting for freedom of religion, yes, the, the religion that was really fighting the most for freedom of religion were the Catholics, because Maryland had a big ton of Catholics, and, and uh, uh, there were Catholics who signed the Constitution, and Catholics who were at the Continental Congress the whole time, because Maryland had so many Catholics. Um, and we were, when we were trying early in the war to recruit Quebec to be the 14th state, uh, they were Catholic, so we had to be cool about that. But over time, certain laws were made that were not very religiously free. For example, in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, they had made laws that were, um, they said you had to take a, a, a Christian oath to be a member of the government. Now, this was actually done to prevent Quakers from running for office, because Quakers didn't take any oaths, um, and the Quakers were the majority, and they were trying to be not cool about it. Um, but actually, Chaim Solomon and Sexius uh, were uh, two of the two of the people who really pushed the hardest to get rid of that rule, because they're like, hey, we didn't do anything wrong. We'll take an oath, but we just can't take that specific oath. Um, and, and then that developed into the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment, and then famously, George Washington writing to the synagogue in Rhode Island. And he wrote saying, you have nothing to fear. We are, um, this is a free country where you can celebrate your chosen beliefs as you choose to believe. And uh, th there's a famous line in there, which if you watch the play Hamilton, you will recognize. Uh, it's actually taken from the Hebrew Bible, which most of the founders knew well. It, it, basically the First Testament, and uh, it's the line, uh, each, each man, and I'm going to try and quote it, but it'll be a little wrong, it's a paraphrase quote, uh, but each of us will sit under our own uh, uh, fig tree. I want to sit under my own tree. And I don't remember how it goes. I apologize. <laughs> but he quotes the, um, the Hebrew Bible and says, each of us shall sit under our own vine. 
and 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 the point is the verse he takes it from is very specifically saying like we all we all may you know it's it's God's wish that we all celebrate the way we we feel on the inside and we should all be citizens of the same community and be liberal enough to live together so that's an extraordinarily brief summation of how Jews affected the American Revolution. Some of them played roles in the war, some of them played roles in finances, uh, some of them played roles in the community. And, and they all helped build our free country that we live in today. So, happy Yom Kippur. I hope your sins have been forgiven. Please uh, like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. That way more people can see it and you can see more of what I put out. And uh, if you have any questions or comments or recommendations, videos you might like to watch, please put it down in the description. Also, I got some new lighting and it, I think it looks a little better. I think you might have heard my son crying in the other room, but we're not going to pretend that didn't happen. But let me know about that too. Thank you and I will see you tomorrow.